Hello, my name is Natasha Diaz. I am a longtime performer. Please don't make me list my bio. I will link something below so that you can see um, anything you want to know about me. Um, but basically, I am a um, I'm an actor, singer, dancer, person who has, uh, like everyone else in this business, navigated this moment of this pandemic, um, worried. Um, scared, um, receiving and being witness to and perhaps participating in all of this dialogue about um, representation in this country and, uh, and how desperately that needs to change. Um, primarily my, my interest in doing a talk at all really came about immediately when this pandemic hit and theaters shut down. I felt a visceral um, fear, like I wanted to come to the rescue of any theater that I knew that I was close with, um, to do anything that I could to talk about it, to, um, to help them continue to have funds coming into their, um, to their theaters. Um, and I've analyzed in myself the reason why I wanted to do that. It's much like my impulse to be an actor. Um, I am, my, my voice, I find my contribution to society and uh, humanity, um, I have chosen to be the theater. Um, and because I'm not really that smart, <laughs> I'm not really good at that much else. But when this pandemic hit, um, I was alarmed by the silence from our government and on the news about the devastation that was happening to the theater as they were, there was complete closure to this whole uh, sector of, uh, of the population, artists, anyone connected with theater was really viscerally um, offended, scared and shocked. Um, as theaters began to find their footing and uh, do what they needed to do to, to try to keep funds coming to the theater and um, to try to move forward, I, um, I've participated in uh, wonderful things online that, that were really trying to mine the moment, not only just uh, technically, but to really begin to try to understand these um, sociological changes that were being thrust upon us. Um, and still, I felt, even as the pandemic rolled on, I still felt uh, frightened that um, the artistic conversation seemed to be uh, ha ha barely audible because there was none, right? We were all closed. Um, I am here because for selfish reasons, really. I've done a lot of talking with a lot of folks privately and on little podcasts here and there. Um, but I, this is a personal, a personal uh, quest. I'm feeling very quixotic. I have been feeling very quixotic about this subject. Um, I really have longed to make a space for a purely artistic conversation when, when I speak about what is next for theater. That's what this talk is about. Um, and I, I'm so grateful to have people, collaborators, um, fighters in the trenches who are, <laughs> I, I admire them so much because they're not just quixotic, they're there making bridges, 
and, and tackling these questions right now. And as first as employers, I'm very excited to be able to work um, uh, with a couple of them this year, others as friends, um, but I'm, I really wanted to seek their, um, to check in with them as leaders and as curators of what is coming next for their theaters. Um, I'm primarily interested in the regional um, aspect of this, again, only because I don't feel like I'm qualified to speak to, um, to the Broadway, um, to, to the future of, of what's coming with Broadway, nor the financial uh, or, yeah, nor the financial um, fallout from, from, from the changes that are happening um, and what need to happen. Um, I am so, so very, very excited to have with me um, Melia, Melia Vincessen. She is an Obi award-winning director who has directed around the country and internationally and is the new artistic director at Hartford Stage and the first female artistic director of Hartford Stage. Um, Latina in Jewish, <laughs> not that that matters, but, oh, and by the way, I'd like to also say, none of these are box checking, okay? These are my friends. Um, I love that they are my friends and that they are different uh, colors and textures, I think is no accident. Um, so I'm not here to check boxes. I'm here to have this wonderful conversation with, artists that I would trust with my life on stage and off um, and their taste and their guidance and their leadership. So I have uh, Melia Vincessen with me, who I am so thrilled, thrilled and grateful to, who have um, worked with all this pandemic, God bless her. And I have Jerry Dixon, Jerry Dixon is an award-winning director, actor, writer, teacher, and performing arts consultant. He is currently the artistic director of the Village Theater, known for pre-Broadway development of Next to Normal, It Should Have Been You, and Million Dollar Quartet. His theater credits span across Broadway, off-Broadway, regional, and international venues. He has written for Broadway, television, and film. He is also an award-winning voiceover artist and concert soloist and former co-star of mine in the last company of Tick, Tick, Boom off Broadway. Um, Jerry has, um, has traveled a span of time in this business that I find uh, singular and very, uh, his, his opinion and his lens as, a, as an actor, having navigated these, um, these waters and everything that that implies for the last you know, 15, 20 years to being in a position of leadership. And, ah, oh, Melia is telling me she helped Jonathan Larson with Tick, Tick, Boom. <laughs> okay, I love that. Sorry, that's, that's an, oh my God, that's um, amazing. Oh my God. So long ago. <laughs> yeah. I was four. <laughs> yeah, but that's magical, you see. And I don't think that these associations are accidental, which I love. I love, love, love that. Um, what's to say about Mike Isaacson? I mean, <laughs> I, I tried to edit his bio and I was unsuccessful. So I will just say Mike Isaacson is a producer of over 25 and off-Broadway off -Broadway and, uh, and Broadway musicals and plays, national tours, <laughs> London productions, um, for the past 24 years, he has worked with his partner, Kristen Kasky, to bring countless pieces to the stage. Isaacson is also the artistic director and executive producer of the Muni in St. Louis, the third person to hold this position in the Muni's 103-year history. Now in his 10th season, he has produced 57 Muni shows, 23 of which have been new to the Muni audience. Um, and... Uh, Mike and I uh, met, I think from afar, he tells me this story when uh, he was there, when I did Anita in West Side Story. Um, and I just, the year he took over was 
a magical year for me since he said, come on and play Velma. <laughs> so that was pretty magical. Um, Mike, you've, uh, it's such an honor. It's such an honor to have you here. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited to, to have your lens on, on moving forward. Um, because, uh, you know, one, one, one could say, you know, anything that is, has been establishment up until now, you know, we just, you know, let's just get rid of it and replace it with something that's, you know, new and better or whatever. And, um, I don't think that that is either possible or, uh, smart or, um, uh, it's, it's not good for theater. And um, I am so, so curious to hear um, where you are with, with these changes and, um, and how you felt uh, about them in the past and where we are now and what you have planned for the future. And last but not least, Matt Redmond. Matt Redmond is my agent. He has been with DGRW since 2017. Um, before DGRW, Matt spent time at Manhattan Theater Club, The Muni, Feinstein's 54 Below, working in directing and producing. He graduated with a BFA in acting, minor in directing from Oklahoma City University. And he is dedicated to fostering young, diverse talent, as well as guiding careers of established artists, thank God. <laughs> I would say thank God. Um, Matt is also uh, young. Matt is young. Um, he's also very uh, vocal and very clear about, um, about his ideas and beliefs in um, representation in theater today. Um, and in, 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 in making a way forward, uh, I mean, he's even suggested, can I, Matt, can I say this? Can I say that about last five years? I don't know what you're gonna say, so sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, it was Matt's idea to pitch um, an African-American cast of the last five years to the company that finally produced it. Um, and I think that is, you know, yes, there's been incredible ideas that are popping out here and there, but um, I, just to give you an idea of, of the kind of uh, expansion that, um, that these people, these, these people who have agreed to, to chat with me today, thank you all for being here. Um, and um, I'm, uh, for this quixotic, need. Um, again, I, I, I felt like I needed to protect um, the purpose of theater. And the way it is, uh, the way it comes together, the impulse that creates a piece. And um, because I, I worry um, and I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Okay, let me just put that out right now. I'm going to play devil's advocate a lot. Um, I have felt like there has been lots of um, prescriptive um, box checking and, uh, you know, commanding. There's been, there's been a lot of cleaning out, certainly, of, of, abuses of power in theater and in really everywhere in our society, yeah. Um, but I, I have been afraid of the, at least what I perceive to be prescriptive changes that I'm hearing that theaters ought to do or that pieces ought to have. Now, listen, I am the last person on earth as a POC, which I still I still chafe at that label because I think all labels are just that. They're labels. They are surface. They are not um, 
their surface. So I am the last person who would, who would say, yeah, you know, give me a better avenue to a job. However, I say where I've had a lot of experiences in this pandemic for, with people and companies and pieces that are, I see them trying to open up casting, open up uh, types of pieces that they're doing. Um, and I'm of two minds. I got to be honest, I'm of, I'm of two minds. Part of me is a purist. And I, you know, I don't need to see something updated because a piece has its own set of what was important back then. You know, there say that there was, you know, it could be any, any play, any musical. And, and it's my job in my mind as a performer to adhere to those set of um, the parameters of that time, to inhabit the parameters of that time and to present it fully. Um, I'm, I, I sort of chafe against having things that are always catering to, to us now, but in a way they have to. And I understand that. Um, Mike, what do you, what do you feel about like the balance between having new material and presenting new things um, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to keep this specifically for the Muni right now, because part of what is so interesting to me is that all of you have your audience that you are curating and you know, your subscribers, you're trying to get more, uh, subscribers, um, and your audience matters <laughs> what your audience thinks and what they, uh, and what they expect matters. And I realize that they trust you to curate a season that they will pay to see. Um, and Mike, I'm almost done with my lengthy question, <laughs> but it's, what do you say? What do you say to those people who are, and I won't say it's not, and again, I'm playing devil's advocate, who are not racist, but who, and probably would not feel free to say at this time, I'm not interested in seeing an African-American themed show. I'm not, I'm not racist. I'm just not interested. What do you say? How do we as storytellers and as teachers of this moment, how, how do we reach, how do we reach these people without totally smacking them across the head with things that are, that are too much that they won't buy a ticket to because you can't force people to buy a ticket. That's the thing about art. So what do you do, Mike? What do you do? Sorry. Well, no, it's, it's a great question. It's in many ways the question. So, I mean, all I can answer is based on my experience and what I've done. And I think everybody here will have a different answer because we're all, we have theaters with different missions with different audiences. So I came aboard and inherited this, you know, 97 year old institution, whatever it was at the time that had some really remarkable things about it in terms of, you know, the, the Muni was a civic idea before it was an artistic idea, right? It was founded by a mayor. And he said, I believe we can be better citizens of St. Louis if we all gather in this park and see these works. And so that has always been the soil. And then eventually it developed into sort of an artistic home. But, but the two um, always exist together. So we have, because of that and because of our origins, we have some fundamentals that are thrilling the um the access we have a 1500 free seats a night we have programs where people throughout our community who would have no access to theater not only are brought to the theater but we provide the transportation and we're talking people from extreme um with big disabilities to women from shelters family so 
So that sense of community and a bigger idea um, is, is essential, necessary, and there. The other thing is socially and culturally, it also has the gift of ritual. It's a part of people's lives. They've been coming for generations, their parents, their grandparents, which is such a gift to be handed. It, it's, you know, it's daunting, but it's incredible. I wish it for all my colleagues. And that's part of it's just being around for a hundred years, to be honest. The longer you run, the longer you run. But it is also within the culture of St. Louis. And I say this quite proudly to all my sister institutions, really the only public space where people walk into it knowing they're going to be seated next to people very different from themselves because of that tradition and that thing, right? So, so you already have this, you ask the question, how do you get them interested? Uh, it's already part of baked into the expectation, but to address the question directly, what I have tried to do is all those conversations are how you talk to people and how you share their vision. And from day one, I, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a talking point. I say constantly remind people, I say, okay, seven huge musicals, one after another, right? If I took you in a car and we went to uh, what's left of a movie mall, and I said, great, you're going to go see seven music or seven movies right now. I don't expect you to love all seven. I don't expect you to do that like you understand. But the adventure is the experience, right? So my point of view is if you give us the gift of seven summer nights, I'm going to give you incredible variety. So and Mike, but Mike, you said something. Oh, did Mike disappear? No, I'm here, aren't I? Okay. Yeah, you're there. Um, but Mike, you, you just said something very interesting. Um, About it, time. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you said you're not gonna you're not gonna like every single one. Um, I I thank but you. Let me finish the second part of that sentence. What I have to make sure is that it's done exceptionally, that it's exciting and it's vibrant and it's magical and it's at the highest caliber talent level. So you may walk out and go, not my thing, but boy, they really did it. And you know what? That's the best I can do. I cannot control, you know, what is people's minds and hearts when they sit in the seats, I can give them what we can give. And that I say, because we've all joined in on that, including the board and, and all of that, everything we've done to the theater over these 10 years in the vision system has been has worked, it has re-engaged the community. But something you said earlier is, I, I think when you're looking at a show, and this is the reality we're all in, I'm gonna stop and then turn it over to colleagues. You do have to look at every show as a case by case basis. And you have to look at honestly, and where you are and what the audience is. And also, so I'll say for example, this, this, this is where we live in. So this summer I'm doing Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, right? And people love this thing and they love this thing. And oh my God, and for years people were like, what are you gonna do with Seven Brides? Seven Brides, yeah, 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 whatever. Okay, finally, slot opens, great. We're gonna do Seven Brides, thrilling. Announced the show and being a very smart artistic director, I then read the script. <laughs> <laughs> and I broke out in hives. And then, all, you know, I, I'm literally calling all the women I work with who love this thing and going, can you tell me why you love this thing? And they're mentioning the cowboys and the boots and the dancing and the dancing. And I was like, you know, there's this kidnapping, right? And they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's kind of, eh, eh, oh, good luck with that. Like, you gotta be kidding me, right? We need to talk about it. so. So though you have those moments, right? And I said to myself, I really read it. And I said, I can't do this. So I went to MTI and I said, here's what I would like to do. And I met with all the heirs of the estate. And I said, can we look at this and the journey of the women in the show? And it's still gonna be a musical comedy and that, but can we look at their role 
the idea of consent and have a, I have a fun way to solve it. And, and we worked with the original author. And so that's what we're going to do on stage this summer. Now, if you know Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, just casually, you may not even know the difference. They still end up in the mountain. They still end up trapped, you know, all of it. But how their agency in the whole thing is different. The other thing is when I really studied it was the, you know, these film to stage, they're just so hard. And Millie, who's the female protagonist, she's, the camera loves her in the film and it gives her a strength that's not on the page. And so we've done a prologue and an epilogue, sort of her, like giving it a frame so everybody knows what we're doing, a once upon a time sense, and that, and then we go. Mike, are you, are you allowed to talk about uh, Chicago as well? well uh, I hope so, what do you mean? You know, what, you're, what you're doing with that, because that's also very interesting, just, 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 the, just casting, casting wise, in terms of like responding to this moment. Um, yeah, I mean, this is where I'm gonna sound, con- so, so what I think you're talking about is Jay Harrison G is playing Velma. So we did Kinky Boots in 2019. And, you know, one of the amazing things about the Muni, and I feel like I'm dominating here, so I wanna turn it over to my colleagues, um, is I can feel when an audience kind of just falls in love with somebody on that stage because part of it is they really feel like these people are coming to share their gifts with them. And I had never seen the power of, I mean, they were screaming for Jay. And I was watching him one night and I thought, oh my God, he'd be an amazing Velma. Well, and so that's what happened. I mean, it was, you know, so, but you said the same thing to me, Mike. I bet you say that to all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I mean, it's, it's a fascinating choice. Um, it's a fascinating choice. And also, but, you know, you also look at the artist and you know who the character of Velma is and you see in something where you go, oh, there's something that that person has that I think really connects with the possibility of that character. It's not a random choice. It's like you see that energy and you see that, I mean, a director should talk about this, but you know, and again, it's my idea, but I took it to the director and I said, look at what do you think in conversations, you know, no one's an island. All right, I'm gonna be quiet. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's, that's it's fascinating, Mike. And thank you for staying on the, on the regional side. Um, I'm, I'm very interested. Um, I mean, Melia, you, <laughs> well, I, I can look at how you've spent this year and I think that's sort of like, you know, you were going, look at this spotlight. This is what we're going to look at. And this is what we're going to see. Um, I would love for you to, um, to talk about becoming the first female artistic director there. And then this happening. And then you having to curate this year um, with pieces that you are um, that you wanted to put forward. And um, I would actually love just to take a minute to talk about um, the last thing that you and I did together because I have very interesting, um, if you if we're allowed to talk about it. Um, so, so how did you react to this? Like, you know, I mean, you had a season planned. Yeah. Well, like all of us, right? I mean, um, the the challenges of this year can't be uh, overstated. I think it's been, you know, an utterly surreal journey for all of us. At the same time, now that we're coming out of it or entering what I think will be in some ways an equally difficult for different reasons year, right? I mean, we're really um, uh, challenged moving forward. However, I'm so grateful for this position. I'm so grateful for the community of Hartford, grateful for the Hartford Stage Board that has been incredibly supportive, grateful for the, we are a staff of 16 at Hartford Stage right now, friends. We went from uh, 70 plus employees to 16 through this pandemic. And we are now 
um, in the process of rehiring so we can reopen in the fall. But um, done. I mean, have you had people, have you had, I mean, has there been like a, a great response in your community so that to, to enable that to happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I cannot speak highly enough of the Hartford region and the generosity and dedication to our theater. So in a sense, you know, when you when we speak about why theater and the art of theater, I am I am so moved by the fact that this almost 60 year old regional theater has been kept alive by the love of its donors board patrons and community. Uh, we're certainly working. I mean, as as you mentioned, right, I grew up in Mexico City. I'm my father's Mexican. Um, and part of what I love about Hartford is that it's 47% Latinx as a community that is not necessarily reflective of our audience yet, but uh, really enjoying the challenge and pleasure of engaging with communities that maybe haven't been brought into Hartford stage previously and really animating that community. I have great partners on my block where situated uh, Caddy Corner from Capital Community College, which is a, a, a great institution, a two-year community college that serves a BIPOC community in Hartford. And uh, Christ Church Cathedral is a good Jewish girl. I'm ready to become an Episcopalian because of this amazing uh, Reverend Dean, who is the, the priest for uh, uh uh, for Christchurch Cathedral, we've done babysitting initiatives together uh, before the pandemic so that you could come to a show, park your kids. I don't know. I have two children, just in full disclosure, but it's great to park them so you can see a play. And I, I think, you know, babysitting and daycare can be one of the great obstacles to uh, younger families coming to the theater. So that was one of my early initiatives in Hartford. Anyway. All to say, the community has been so supportive. And I love what Mike said about the Muni. I think, you know, this way of turning classics, wrestling with plays that are known, works that are known. Natasha, you're going to be part, I hope, your agent's on the call. So I'll just <laughs> make sure all is okay of uh, my inaugural production at Hartford Stage, which will be a really new version of A Wilderness, Eugene O'Neill's only comedy, with a multicultural cast that brings their own backgrounds to this piece. And, and this mix of anachronism for that piece and live music. So I don't know, Matt, tell me, I, you know, it seems to me Natasha has a gorgeous voice and we should have her sing, but we can discuss that separately. We, there could be a singing fee for it. <laughs> no singing fee, <laughs> part of performance contract. But um, <laughs> the way of that wrestling classic plays. So apropos your question and apropos Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, it's how do you take something that is in the canon, whatever, however we define that, and say, we all own it. We all own it. It speaks to all of us. And we can wrestle these plays in production and make them speak to a larger audience than its artists initially could imagine. But Melia, you, you bring up a point, which is, which is something, um, I'm gonna sort of wrestle this uh, conversation a little bit away from, from where it's going only because I'm really, this is part of what I'm very curious about. Um, and, and yes, it's not, I don't think there, it is the solution to throw out everything that was written before in 19, you know, 80 and like consider it old and the way it's done, it's not going to happen. Um, but at the same time, I do feel like, and this is a casting thing, you know, and Jerry, I think this is your, you know, as, as your, your, as your actor self, I would love to hear what you have to say with this. And, and Matt, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. I'm as a purist, I would tend to, I, I just want to make sure that the stuff that's happening nowadays with all of the um, uh, people criticizing openly the choices that people are making either with pieces or with casting, I just worry that the cure might be worse than the disease. 
And I don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. I, I, again, I'm the last person on earth to, to say, no, don't give me a box so that I can actually have a job. However, I do believe, I do believe in this sort of the sanctity of artistic choice of someone's piece. So, so can I speak to that for a moment? Um, and then Matt and Jerry over to both of you, but just to sort of close this, I have been casting brilliant American actors since I started in this profession years ago. And by American actors, I mean the range of voices and shapes and colors that American actors come in. So if you're casting an O'Neill play, you're not casting only people of Irish American descent. It is an act of imagination to stage a play. Right. If you're casting an Ibsen production, you're not only looking for Norwegians. I mean, this is crazy. Right. And so you have to go to the essence of a work as a director. You go to what is it that this place speaks to and how can I communicate that to an audience? So it's not about checking boxes. It's about getting to the heart of what the great American theater can be using all the voices from the centuries and and channeling them through these vehicles that are the American acting community that come in a range of um, amazing uh, and genuine um, gradations of voice and qualities and emotional presence. And that's the goal. Right. So, so when I turn to O'Neill, I go, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I was raised in a Zionist yeshiva in Mexico City. You can't tell me about what type I am. And I assume that of every actor who walks in a room, that the point is, can they connect to the essence of the material? And can we tell a story that is the bigger picture okay. about what it means to be a human? So that's my rant. I will mute now yeah. and yeah. let smarter people talk. No, no, Melia, that's exactly, you hit exactly what I was hoping to, to, to hit on. I mean, as a performer, I would much rather, and the times that I have found out that I was a box that was checked, I, I got sad. I was actually like, and I know that it's, I know that it's well-meaning. And I know that much like a child learning cursive, you have to have lines to help guide people. You have to have ways to help people think differently. And I get that. I get that. This is a necessary time to help guide certain people or institutions to think more inclusively. Um, I just, I would prefer, I mean, aren't we all going towards this? Let the, let the, let the people who, but like Melia said, best illuminate the intent and character of the piece no matter what they look like. I mean, Arthur Lawrence, I will never forget him saying this about West Side Story, theater is not literal. One gun tells you kids kill. You know, and, and, and however, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna play, now I'm gonna play devil's advocate. It is a picture, right? Theater is a picture. And though I don't feel like a color, it is a painting. It is an energic painting. Um, as much as I, that's Melia, like, like, like you said, like someone's essence who understands the material, but I think that there are certain cultural, delicate details that not everybody understands. Right, and if we are looking to paint a certain culture or paint uh, or to do to 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 properly represent any culture, I think putting any kind of person based on what they look like is is it might not be might not be honoring what that specific culture is. So where are Jerry? Where like what? 
what happens? I mean, you've lived both sides of that. What are you doing? Um, How was your experience, you know? Well, let me start from, from where I am now as an artistic director uh, and then work, it, work backwards. Um, you talked about boxes and labels. And I think one of the things that um, being a, 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 an artistic leader of a, of a Pacific Northwest theater company, which has its own sensibilities, very uh, in hyper quotes and underlined black marker woke um, <laughs> in theory. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, uh, there's a lot of friction points, I'll just say, uh, with, with my sensibilities. Um, I, I know that as a brown gay person leading that theater company, I have to always have that box cutter in my pocket to cut my way out of that box that when people want to put me in. I always have to have that shredder to put that label in because it's going to happen, but it's what you do with it. I said, like, go ahead and go ahead and put me in a box. I will work my way out of it. And one of the things that for my particular theater company is we develop a lot of new work. And so when you compare that to the classic work that we also do, there is a fluency that these amazing new writers have for writing characters of diverse natures all over the spectrum. There's this adroitness that they have they they get it now but there's also the director who could put that fluency into just like me has said into a classic they do not ignore the otherness of the of the actor they embrace that and allow that to come through because i as a brown actor i have been in the eurocentric play or musical i have been in that role and, and it just makes it better. It better. just makes it better, <laughs> right. Jerry, when you bring yes. your own background, when the actors yes. bring their... Thank you. You Sorry don't erase to... it. You don't... Cl... No, it's good. This is, this is why we're here. You don't cloak it. You say, for instance, if, if I'm playing... Um, uh, I, I can think about a line like, um, man, the only trouble I have in the world is my girl doesn't love me. Was well, a brown man in America saying that it's kind of hollow. So I have to figure out a way to make that true for me. Maybe I'm lying to myself, maybe, whatever. Maybe I'm disillusioned, but it has to be true somehow or the audience will smell that, right? The other thing, I want to go back to something Mike said about the union. I just love it. I love about the audience and, our, and, and Melia, that our responsibility to what we're curating. For, for, Human beings surprise me all the time because we invite them in at our theater to say, come see yourselves on stage. And they do. And then we also invite them to come see not yourself and love that too. And they do. They come and see people that look like them and sound like them and they love it. And then they see strangers and Martians like, I don't know what they're talking about, but I love their commitment to it. So once, once we get the fear that they won't come to the theater because we're doing Raise in the Musical that centers on a black family and there's only one white dude in it, and he's the racist, they recognize I want my family to have the best school, house, safety. They go, oh, yeah, I want those things too. It's not really different. And we just have to make sure that we just have a seat at the table for everybody. People will surprise us every time if we let them. We cannot curate them into this narrow avenue of things well, that we think they'll like. Exactly. It's exciting. I, I love that, Jerry. And, you know, we bring the, the question is to sort of call in, not call out, right? Mm. Is to bring everybody in and say these plays and these actors and this vision of what we're curating is for all of you. Amelia, this now, is. This is exactly what I'm saying is that I feel like more often than not, I we've been in our separate theaters in our separate states and our separate houses going, OK, I know what I'm going to do to go forward. And, and there's been such a feeling of like, I'm scared. You know, let's be honest. There's been a lot of like, I'm scared to take a step. I'm scared it's going to be wrong. 
because there will be a lot of backlash. And I, I, th I think I think it's really important, though, to when you talk about the backlash and you talk about the comments, we are living in a new time. The social media world is all new within the last two to three years. I mean, the intensity of it, and certainly during the pandemic. And everyone is learning. It's gonna take a few more years to really understand its value and then times when it's not of value and what a voice is and how a conversation matters. It's the wild west right now. No, and you know, I, I, I have these in, in having, in wanting to have this talk with people that I trust, artistic collaborators and, and, and theatrical curators that I trust, I hear things creep into my consciousness. I heard Bill Maher say, we, we cater to the most offended among us. And I think, I think, you know, and then I think of how Lin-Manuel has been sort of receiving backlash because of uh, the Dominican, uh, his choices. Again, his choices. And this is where, guys, this is where I, I, I go, you need to hold holy someone's artistic choices and their vision. And, and there's, I think that there's a right now it's different. It's not like you can't talk to Jerome Robbins, like and the things are different. Like Jerome Robbins wouldn't get very far today because that kind of, you know, power and, and sort of superiority. And, and frankly, I, I don't know if I agree. I think there are plenty of Jerome Robbins is doing oh. very, very well right now right jerry Indeed. you're with Indeed. me on this <laughs> and and we know who they are and they're doing just great okay yeah so <laughs> and i look beside me i go i could not get away with what you just did well yeah, man me neither <laughs> so so that point okay so point so point point taken so it's now that we have to like I just, I, again, my interest is in preserving the right for a piece to be what it is and for us to, again, I mean, and to be, it's impossible. Again, I'm quixotic and I know that. To be more gentle about the artistic conversation and the choices saying, we see, we know as storytellers and as teachers, we know right now what we have ahead of us. It's huge, but it's, but it's choice by choice that we're going to have to go now. It's yeah, Natasha, I think what you're talking about, I, I, I want to sort of partnership with you on this message because I think what you're really getting at, it, the essence of it is we are stewards of people's work, other people's work. Yes. We did not write most of the things that we collaborate on. No, no. So, we are we are caretakers of that work and sometimes there's a pure idea that you don't want to fuck with yes you want to make sure that the the writer who took five to ten years to that's get something right. ready that you don't mess with that and break it because my job and melia's job and michael's job is to leave things better than we found them we leave the play better than we found it we pick it up we we dig deep and we go this will be better because we are mindful. Yes, Amen. there will be some times when we go, yeah, this might need to be all white. And maybe that's the strongest version. Most of the time, I don't think but that's true. I agree Most with you time, because it's about true. the essence. I it's agree. About the essence. I mean, and it's the essence. The if it's a family. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I'm Absolutely. sorry, Jerry. I'm just no, excited no, by the, everything you're it's saying. It's so great because the writer will see your care. That's Even right. Even if you even if it doesn't look anything like what they imagine, they go, wow, somebody was really careful with my baby. They took care of it. And I think there's no better thing than an, art, than, than an artist seeing someone take care of their work. They understand that you didn't do it willy nilly. They understand the care that went into an all female Othello. Amazing. But if you think if those writers were alive today, they would be supporting this. The great theatrical thinkers would go like, yeah, duh, 
that's who's really smart and good for the role. Like, you know, so, so I think the sense theater is constantly shifting and alive. That's what we've missed, right? This flatness of, of, of this medium for me. And I, it, I, I know it's a, a very subjective take. So, so I, I say it with all respect to folks who have really found that this access has been a gift. I understand that too. Personally, for me, the joy is, is the alchemy that happens in a group of people breathing and speaking and feeling together, the communality. And I think in that case, the, the color of each actor um, is, 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 is a gift to the storytelling and a reflection of our contemporary society, as opposed to viewing plays like, like the Mona Lisa behind three frigging planes of glass and, and knowing it's great, but I feel nothing looking at it, the as opposed to sitting in a theater and feeling, oh my God, this play was written what year? And it speaks to my own stresses with my adolescent child, you know? So, but what about, what about, someone coming into the room who doesn't pick up on or who just just doesn't understand it. An actor may not understand or may not uh, be able to inhabit. A but story. that's a director's job. <laughs> that's what to say. Well, that's what we do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Also, and it's also I'm not only the actor, but the, that engagement for the audience. Make them understand even before they arrive at your theater. There are ways to do this. I had a, a you know, and I, you want to shake people and go, don't you read? Um, but you don't do that. You invite them in more. You invite them in and say, by the way, maybe look at it this way. We were just having a, a little bit of a discourse about, um, so I, I love Jason Robert Brown's work. And, um, and it, almost got to the argument point about, um, the second song um, on the bow, on the deck of a sailing ship, nine, uh, 1492. And people were adamant that it was about colonialism, adamant that we should take it out or have him rewrite it. And I said, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to have to drop a name because that's my buddy and you're flat wrong. There was something else going on in the world besides the discovery of America in 1492, and that was the exile of Jews out of Spain. There was a brokerage to get Jews out of Spain. That is what that song is about. People, you have to read. You have to dig deeper. You can't get all of your information on Twitter. You have to be curious and know yes. some history. I mean, this yes. is like this conversation about who should play Evita. Right? So she should be Latina. What do we mean by Latina? Do we mean indigenous or do we mean Argentinian and Italian? I mean, German and Italian, which is what the Argentinian ruling class was, right? I mean, uh, I'm so with you, Jerry. Yeah, I just, and, and, but if they don't, my point was that if they don't read, then it's our responsibility to shove that dramaturgy down their throats to make sure and they understand And figure out something. how to reach them, right? I mean, yes. that's where, yeah. how do we reach our audiences to say, here's what this playwright intended. Here's my vision for this playwright. Here is why these people are telling the story. Matt, you've unmuted. I will mute so <laughs> you can actually speak. No, I just, I wanted to go back to what you said about call in versus call out because I think it leads to exactly what you just said. You know, it's about calling people in. And to, to Bill Maher's point, we can't, while maybe we can't cater to the most offended, we also can't cater to the least offended. And, you know, we can't cater to those who are afraid to, to tiptoe around or afraid they'll get backlash. And we sure as hell can't cater to the not racist who just doesn't want to see the black story because that's racist and it, to not want to see the black story that's just what it's about you know but people want, we can't, doesn't want to admit that i mean like i mean i know that i know that this is why i'm afraid of the broadway conversation because <laughs> honestly well every theater it's about numbers and i do get that yeah. um but, but we can't we can't cater 
I, I'm not an artistic director, so I can, of course, say whatever I want on the matter, but you can't cater to that. You just can't. You can't cater to the to the fragile white person who might not want to see Smokey Joe's Cafe because there's not enough people who look like them on that stage. You can't, you just can't cater to that audience because that's, that it's just wrong. I don't even know the other word to say it other than it's wrong. And you can't cater to the people who are afraid to be wrong and afraid to misstep because yeah, we're in a very different time, a time that I, I am as an artist coming up in. I didn't come up as an artist and as a leader, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. I, so I have, I don't want to say luxury, but this is what I'm coming up in. And I'm coming up in a time where I'm not, I'm not really afraid personally to misstep because I don't, I, I don't think I'm going to. And if I do, I'll deal with it. But that's no one else's problem but my own. If yeah. I, you know, post the wrong thing onto Instagram or post the wrong Facebook comment, I did it. I'll deal with it. You know, I don't need I don't need the muni to cater to me, to, you know, to cater to that dumb white kid who made a mistake. You know, I, you know, we want to see today's audience of my generation for the most part, couldn't speak for everyone, but for the most part, wants to see everything. They want to see everyone on stage. They want to see everything on stage. And from my perspective, because I am very much the middleman of this industry of talking to Natasha in this box and then talking to all three of you on my email and getting the breakdowns every day, getting the breakdowns of what you all, yeah, I'm pointing to you as if you can see that I'm pointing to you, uh, of what you all are looking to put on your stage. And I know what that looks like. And for some places it's because they need to add more inclusivity onto their stage. And for some people, they don't have to worry about that, be it because they're already doing it or be it because they're in a theater in Texas with an audience that doesn't care about it or Florida that doesn't care about it, you know? And those breakdowns and those roles that people are looking to fill, they just, you know, we cannot, we, we can't cater to the people who are going to be offended by that breakdown. Because I've seen breakdowns in the past year that are for tra traditionally white, I don't even like that phrase, for roles that are traditionally cast white, only seeking BIPOC actors. And I'm not offended by that in the slightest, in the slightest. Um, because it's it's what we should be it's what we should be looking for right I'm, now because it's not to say only a BIPOC person is going to be the next alphabet it's not to say only a BIPOC person is going to be the next whomever it's to say we have not prioritized searching for BIPOC actors to play these roles we have not prior we have not given space in the room for BIPOC actors is a very, to even attempt these roles. That's a very important distinction between that. Um, we have to say goodbye to Amelia. Hi, do you want Amelia? Bye, Amelia. Really great conversation. Thank you yes. so much. So nice to meet you. But one of the things that Michael and uh, both Mike and uh, Amelia said is, is the love that our communities have for our regional theaters is unsurpassed. And I would be remiss if I didn't say how much I was astounded of the outpouring of not only, of course, the dollars, because they help, um, but just the support and the calls of support, making sure our theater was going to survive. And then the money, because that's what it takes. And we have a, we're a four, uh, four venue, um, two uh, city a theater company, and the generosity has been just um, just outstanding. So I just want to uh, make sure I say that. I, I think what what was astounding about that, and we experienced the same thing, and now heading into opening a show in five weeks, four weeks. Um, I think, you know, Natasha, you alluded to something at the top of this that our community, <clears throat> and this is sort of what I'm talking to people as they come back, the pandemic hit and we were told you are non-essential. Stop. And then 
not only was that what we were told, where we fit, where we're, and we understood that, we got it. At the same time, we are people, you know, it is a cliche, but we are different beasts. And our energy and our connection, it's not what we do, it is who we are. And all the ideas we're talking about, the room and how we create and how we connect. And I'm with what she said about the Zoom thing. It For me, it went from like A to F and I'm very proud of the series we put together and how it worked in that moment. And I don't ever wanna do it again because it isn't this. And, and not being who we are has been the real pain. And so we're coming out of this to sort of refigure out what that is and what that means now. The, the astonishing thing is, tipping off of what Jerry said, the support from the community was unbelievable. And even now, our, our subscription renewal has never been higher. Like they were cheering for us to come back. I mean, I couldn't go anywhere. We're gonna have a season, right? We're gonna be able to do this. And you know, it's, I don't really understand it fully yet. I mean, I think the other thing when you listen to Jerry and stuff, these institutions, these things we do, there's always an element of mystery here. Like to think that the, you really kind of know the answer. I, I had to give up that a long time ago. And, and there's sort of this thing you're kind of shepherding and it's finding its way and there's these conversations coming into it. And you're like, I love this because this is, I use this metaphor when I say, let me take care of your role because I will take care of this part like this. I will hold it like this. That's exactly, that's what we want to do for, for people, for society. This is what we're trying to do. And I, and, and I guess the, the thing that has gotten me alarmed of late is, is all of this attacking that has happened to, to people and how they do things. And I were, and I just, and I worry. I think, you know, I, I just, I understand that. And I think you need to regulate your social media. Everyone has to do that. I think that's a new discipline, a new tool. But again, we're beginning something new and we're figuring out how to have these conversations. And exactly, a lot of them, most of them have very worthy intents underneath their soil, where it's coming from but how they come out and what they are may not result in the impact or idea that that original intention. And you kind of have to give the grace of taking a step back and going, okay, that was kind of hard. And, you know, in some senses, just, you know, there, there's been some ugly stuff. Well, but, my, I mean, this Part of, part of what I think nobody has talked about is how much of, of this, of the psychological dynamics of the last year and a half have contributed to the conversation, all conversations. And like, I mean, I could ask you if we were not in a pandemic, would the George Floyd thing have even happened? But I, I'm going back on my own, I'm going back on my own <laughs> my own desire not to have a political conversation. But I do believe, I mean, what do you guys think about, and this only in so far as it affects the conversations, like you said, that we are trying to have now about representation and moving forward. How much of the pressure of being in lockdown, being estranged from your community, your work, not having money, not, uh, you know, how much of the, psych the psychological effects of that individually and as a society, I feel like we, we sort of haven't even acknowledged that, that that has been a huge part of the characterization of how we speak to each other right now. It's like you say, you, see, you point to a child, you're like, he's getting a little irritated. He needs a nap. <laughs> you can see that he needs a nap. He's tired. Well, there's a lot. I just think that there's a lot of psychological pressure that is coloring all of our conversations right now. And I, I, I don't see a lot of people either aware of it or um, acknowledging it and then maybe taking a step back. Everyone, I mean, for, for a while there, there were so many people who I would characterize as acting out. Yeah, you know, Natasha, um... 
one of the things that I, I definitely grasp is that um, there's a difference between a time of reflection and a, a time of malaise. And these things were sort of running sort of parallel. People, people were in body and spirit and mind were sick. And then they're also that people were in body, mind and spirit were also hopeful. And hopefully these things, hopefully they could mix and you could sit at the table with each of those things and you can sort of work something out so that we can all move forward. Because what I was coming up against was a lot of people who wanted to tear it down. Exactly. Burn it all to the ground. That's right. But I also was meeting people who goes, no, let's rebuild this thing. Let's build it new. And I, I, because I'm an optimist, I believe now it's tilted more into building it up rather than tearing it down. I hope so. I hope so. I think we had a season of like destruction. But here's the thing about the theater's not going anywhere. We're the stories that we're going to be telling in 10 years are going to be informed by this really painful time. And we're going to talk about, we're going to have stories of perseverance, uh, uh, stories of transformation, stories of really getting to know each other. Right now, it seems like we're so opposite, so polarized. But at the same time, you see people fighting, fighting to find commonality. And the storytellers, the writers are going to be the very fuel that we need to tell those stories. Because I, right now we're in the, in the thick of it and it's hard for us to see our way out of it. But there is a way out and, and artists, writers will, will help us with that. I mean, and, and it's, it's, you know, part of what I wanted to do in this talk, and if I'm able to, I will add it in a separate, um, in a separate segment, was what I, I wanted to orient, you know, other pivotal times in history when, you know, when these huge changes happen, you know, wars, uh, any, any huge uh, societal happening, theater has to respond, right? And, I'm, and it has, I'm sure, throughout the world. So this is not the first time that this is happening. <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious, I have someone I'd like to speak to, and if I'm able to do it, I, I will include my talk with him because he's a historian, a theatrical historian. And I, I'm, I'm really interested in comparing it to this moment, to what has come before, you know, and, and as healers, teachers, um, inviters, like you said, Jerry, we, we are, we are, we go to the theater to, to, yes, to see ourselves, but to join with someone else, to join with something that you would not have joined with, to find empathy in the human experience. And I, I mean, I, as far as casting goes, I mean, selfishly, I, I have always hoped, and I know Jerry, you, have, you, you succeeded where you did, you know, when you were an actor, in changing people's minds about what they thought would go like this to their role, right? Because, and, and people like Mike, you see something that goes, ah, that's illuminating something that, I, that is important to be communicated. And Matt, similarly, you had this wonderful idea to bring uh, the last five years to be uh, an African American couple to the to the screen, and that was <laughs> I, I loved it, Matt. This, I just loved it. I thought it was beautiful. I had a couple of people over. I, I bought the uh, the the premium package. Uh, it was just really wonderful. Mike, did you? Know that? I'm glad. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm very glad. I think I, I think something you said though, Natasha, about you know, find coming to the theater for to empathize with each other and, you know, have that shared experience. I think that is exactly what has made us all so, uh, us, has made a lot of people so divided in this time because a lot of people in this industry really struggled to exist without this industry in the last year and a half. And 
and some people did not, everyone handled it differently. And what do you mean by that, Matt? A lot of people without being in a rehearsal room, without going to their show eight times a week, without doing this, they got lost. They got completely lost and everyone handled that differently. And that empathy and that kindness that we typically or hopefully have when we sit down in a theater or when we get to places or whatever, a lot of that went out the door this last year because a lot of people needed that shared space in order to bring that, bring that out in themselves. And kind of like you said, you know, I think there, there's totally a million excuses and a million reasons for why we've all acted the way we've acted in the last year and a half, positively and negatively. Yes. We're all going through it, whether we're having a better day or a worse day, we're all going through it. I mean, and it com has completely contributed to what we've, done in the last year and a half. But I think that we've had, because people really have not been able to disconnect them or had to disconnect themselves from the business like this last year and a half, people didn't know what to do. I mean, I, 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 Lin-Manuel Miranda came to see the Cape Man. I remember the night he came and he was, huh, okay. So, and again, I'm going to go back and say, look, the Cape Man was not glorifying a murderer. It was, uh, it was a fascination of a composer, Paul Simon, of a story of an immigrant boy who had an extraordinary experience. And he became a tabloid sensation because of how he was treated. Salvador Agron was treated. He was almost executed for the crime he committed at age 14, 15. And he became a figure that, I mean, Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt had to come to his aid and say, look at what this child has been through. Are you not even treating, I mean, this is a child. So to even humanize that. And it was, it was a story about examining if, if redemption is, is possible, no matter what your circumstances. And the fact that it was 20 years ahead of its time um, was, I mean, we all knew that, but it got the treatment it got. And so Lynn saying, you know what, God, I'm really, and whether, whether it came from a good place or not, whether Paul Simon, you know, he's, he's a Jew from New York, and he wrote this show, Lynn went home and he started writing in the Heights because that's what, literally that was what started him writing in the Heights as far as I know. And because he was like, I wanted to write a musical with where, where my people are represented differently. But I still don't think that you know, that you throw away the Cape Man because anybody who knows it, like you, like, like we've all been saying, the intent was poetic. I mean, you think Don Giovanni was a, <laughs> was, I mean, like, what, like, come on. The, uh, the, you know, Rigoletto, these are like, these are not great people. These were what great theater was made of. You don't just have things that are, you know, that make everybody happy. You also go to the theater to learn and to be to see characters that are that are, you know, I, you know, so I don't know. And I understand. I know what you all are going to say that it's this is a peg. Sorry, this is a peg of the conversation. This is a peg of the journey that we must go through in order to get to the more refined conversation and per perhaps be able to present the more. Uh, different kinds of stories at different times, but you all have to make that decision. And Mike, I'm, can I ask you to flip now to Broadway producer mm -hmm. and how that thinking changes or does it, or is it similar? Um, no, it's, it's different. I, I feel, I hope that during this crazy career, I've tried to bring one to the other, the lessons do inform. I think the difference is when you're an artistic director of a theater or something like the Muni, 
you're part of a long-term relationship where each show in New York is its own thing. And you also have to look at the, again, the soil beneath it. And you know what? New York as a city has always will and will continue to be the embodiment of America's sort of, that's the city I go there to change myself, to become something. And so it's primal energy is always about becoming the new, where are we? It, that, is, that is the fuel and it's on Wall Street and it's on Broadway and it's on every element. And that's where the pride comes from, the strength. That is singular in this country. It's a different energy in LA. There's a similar thing in Silicon Valley to a degree that, that they're out there literally creating the century, God help us, but it's sort of, you know, there. The rest of literally the rest of the country is not, it's a different, it's a different energy. It's a different way of being. I would, love, I would love for you to speak to, um, I mean, you just announced some very exciting news today on Facebook. What did we announce? Sorry. <laughs> what did my marketing department do? Well, I mean, something is, is going to be on Broadway very soon. Yeah. A new piece. Um, what? Well, I'm sorry. David yes. Byrne um, and Plaza Suite. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, thrilling, thrilling adventures, both of them. And just great, great. You know, I, 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 I think the difference of working, I don't know, it's, it, it is a different thing. Um, and, but it, it each has its own strength and its own profound I'm not going to say weaknesses, but things it is not. And, and the, the, the energy and the um, focus and the discipline of the Broadway culture, I'm really connected, inspired to that. I get off the plane in New York and I feel my molecules changing, changing. And that's something, but that is also not sustainable right. it's a thing right and you do it and then you need to find a balance and the joy i've been i, I look at it, i'd rather be lucky than good any day and to sort of have the whole the sense of building a community backstage and on stage and in the audience and having an institution where i can say to people like jerry dixon i want you to come play and you, Natasha, I want you to come play and try to create an environment that's excellent and no fear allowed. And let's just be who we are and do. I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing that's, that's the most negative about Broadway and the hardest thing. There's so much fear. There's so much awareness of what everybody might thinking. Well, that's, I mean, Mike, I love that, that we have a young, white, female director of On Your Feet. I thought that was genius. I mean, because it works the other way, right? I mean, it works the other way. And, and I wanted the Muni to be a place where I also, you know, I know way too much history, but when you look at a certain era of creating for Broadway and the American musical theater, which I love, we, we have fewer and fewer places where, where artists can learn their voice safely on a certain scale, yeah. right? They, they, there used to be more of them. Tommy Toon choreographed his first show at the Muni. Michael Bennett, like these guys all went out to certain theaters, the, these leaders, and there's fewer and fewer of them. And I wanted this to be a place where people could come and learn that. And, and their own, in it, they're, all they are learning about themselves, to be honest, Jerry, you know, that's what you do. Mike, Here, and you've done it. I mean, you've done it. I'm, uh, can I ask you both a question? And we'll just try to, because I'm curious. When was the last time, I mean, you don't have to, I don't know if, I, I would love to know about this because you're both so progressive and you always have been, at least as, as far as I've known you. I want to know what it was like to have been in rooms with co having conversations where the majority of the people around you were not forward thinking and they were uh, making safe decisions or uh, whatever they thought was more, I guess, what people wanted to see so that more people will buy tickets. Um, obviously, this was probably earlier in your career, Mike. 
if you are privy to conversations like that where uh, here's the thing and this is the way i've always operated you have to be careful about condemning people for things they just don't know you have to become a teacher right and you have to take them by the hand and what i quickly learned the biggest mistake you can make as a producer as an artistic director or whatever i think is to underestimate the audience it really is a common mistake and that was sort of for whatever reasons is what i walked into and i mean this is full circular but literally opening night of chicago at the muni the second show i think it was like 130 degrees oh i think it was <laughs> literally changed the history in the course of the muni how because that audience i don't know you were trying to get your show out and you did it brilliantly but I, I remember i remember sitting down next to my husband or then whatever now husband oh wait wait let me just let me just interrupt you so so mike is talking about when i was doing Velma, the last time they did Chicago right. at the right. At uni, right? So this was Mike's first year. second show of the first season. Second show of the first season of at the Muni, yeah. yeah. And I, I, this it literally changed everything, and I'll never forget. I sat down; it was so hot, and I literally was like, "Have I made the biggest mistake in my life? Like, I'm overwhelmed. Have I done the wrong thing here?" And I turned to Joe and I said, "I'm a." I'm a corpse. I have nothing. You're going to have to tell me how this is going. And the show started. And, you know, remember we did that thing where Velma, Patty Mur or Roxy came out like a lift out of the stage, which they had never done in a hundred years. And I heard this woman behind me go, oh, that's wonderful. And I thought, well, okay, someone's paying attention, you know, and this thing going. And I just remember Joe saying, oh, this is good oh, this is good. And there was this thing building and I was so empty, I couldn't plug into it. And then I remember at the end of the first act, and this has never happened since, the first act ended and the audience exploded. And I mean, exploded. And we had those, like those house lights, that <coughs> thing, right? I remember. And and the house lights came up, which was usually like everyone stop, go get your, you know, intermission drink or whatever. And they kept applauding. I remember. And I thought, oh, okay, the dance has begun. Let's go. Like it literally, I was like, they were literally saying, thank you. We're here. We've been waiting. And it's just been, a, a, it's been like a dance, you know? And I think I really want to tip it to Jerry. The thing you also have to do is you have to allow yourself mistakes to think you're going to be perfect at this. It's just not going to happen. And you learn the leadership thing and you learn that people will bring things to you, not because of who you are or anything you've done, but what they think you embody. And you have to learn how to manage that and allow them that and what those communications are. And and understand you're on a long-term journey and you're and and that's what it is. Um, I wanna I wanna let Jerry take that and then Matt can see one thing and then I wanna and then like we gotta wrap up because it's already so I don't wanna stop. I really don't wanna stop. Yeah. I mean we could you know, have, uh, we could have a act two, but yeah, go ahead, Jerry. I think one of the the best things I did for myself, um when um, the pandemic hit, uh, when I, I flew back from Seattle and <clears throat> decided I needed to do some huge thing for myself because it, it, to go from uh, hundred to zero and like, what are we gonna do? Um, I, I had an executive coach uh, about two years prior. And when I got back to um, New York, I immediately hired them again. And they, this isn't a historian. Um, and it brings me back to something Matt said. And um, this person suggested, uh, I said, what, he goes, what, what are you going to do with your theater? I said, well, I'm going to run it from here, but I, I want to do something. I want to I want to be able to reach out and connect to these people who are not doing the thing they love to do and they know how to do. They know how to do these things. So I said, I want to, I want to like, you know, do a show online with them. And he said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I went, what? I said, oh, I, I know you now. 
you got something going on in there. What is it? He said, I, I don't think it's deep enough. He goes, find their hyphens. Said, That's what your show should be about. So my web series became about finding out their other hidden talents or not so hidden talents. We didn't even talk about show business. Mm -hmm. Up front, we talked bio, and then we talked about what else do you do? And come to find out that there were actor funeral directors, actor uh, architects, actor winemakers, actor caretakers, because if they weren't doing this thing, how do you value yourself? How do we value? Them? So the one thing I will say for us all, whenever these things happen, we have to, it is our responsibility to find out the things underneath, the other things that these people do, that we do, because if you're not doing the other thing, it doesn't mean you've lost your value. Jerry, and that was one of the things I was seeing in the world. Exactly, Jerry. I was actually, when I was teaching uh, during this pandemic, Part of the thing that was so exciting was I, I tried to impart to these kids that it's such a gift to be able to look at what you haven't been able to look at and really go into it. I had a group that were doing Chicago that were just about to do it, just about to do uh, their Zitz probe or whatever, and they never got to it, but they also never did table work. By the end of my courses with them, they were giving performances, sitting there in character, having understood, gone through the show together. My, I mean, I was floored by it. And, and I, I hope that the kids who have gone through this, to, to whatever degree that the people around them, the educators around them and their parents have been successful, I hope they are able to access the gifts that this, that navigating this time will give them for the long run. Um, and I was so touched by this for theaters to be able to look at old productions, to be able to, to really see what went through it because we're so used to be like, bam, you want this, you want this, you want this, but there's so much detail that goes into it. I was very touched during this time to be able to share more of the, of the labor of love that we all uh, go through. Um, I know nobody wants to deal with that ever again, but um, I was I was very touched by it to be able to be able to look at process when it's all about product. You can't help but learn from that. I mean, I feel like you can't help but like connect with your audience more to say, look, we made these choices and we had this discussion. And I mean, I imagine that people are very uh, interested in those things, at least the people that I that I spoke to. Um, I feel like we have so much to be excited about. We have so much to be excited about. Um, I, as an actor, the thing that I immediately touches me is the race issue and the, and the, and the representation issue to have been able to stand on a stage um, in Grand Hotel here in Signature Theater and playing opposite an African-American baron, knowing that whoever was seeing this picture was, this was gonna be their Baron. It was thrilling. It was thrilling. It was thrilling to me. Not only because of the picture, but because God damn, this guy was so brilliant. I mean, stylistically, he had the swagger. He understood the, the lilt of the time. And then he opened up his mouth and the voice that came out. I, it was, I mean, I was, you know, that, can you tell I'm still in love with my co-star? <laughs> His name was Nkrumah Gatling. Um, but the thrill that it was to know that I was a part of that picture was so thrilling. Um, and I talked about this with, um, with Ellis uh, and many other people. I, I, just as an example, you know, the, the, the Cinderella, the Cinderella with Brandy, you know what I'm talking about? I was brought to tears and I could cry now just thinking about it. When, when the fairy tale opened up and you saw all of those different colors, people, and you heard the arrangements, the musical arrangements 
updated, but not, um, but not desecrated. And then you saw them inhabiting the, the grace and the style because, because of, the, of my need to have this artistic discussion. I am, uh, I am a stickler about style and form. And I don't think that uh, anything should be sacrificed for that because style and form is what delivers story right? Whatever the style is and whatever the, the, the choices of the form. So to say that I was touched to see the epaulement of, of people of different colors and them inhabiting the grace of that. And, 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 and lastly, the fairy tale. I could literally cry to see them all living in, that, in the grace of, of that waltz. I mean, that's what's exciting to me. That's what, for me, that is what is coming for, for us now, if we will let it. And I, think, I think that's what people are after right now. I think people are after making, people are after things that make Cinderella like that not special, you know? For as special and wonderful as it is, People are after a business, a Broadway, a Muni, well, and everything that looks like that. And that's a part of this big shift and this big change is to um, eventually, not now, but eventually uh, normalize that and make that the norm. Now, now it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Now it's still crazy. But I, yeah. Well, we just hope to, to be um, curators of a more uh, patient, like Mike said, uh, well, and, and everyone, a gentler conversation, right, Jerry? Like, yeah. like it's- we're longing, for, we're longing for a time when that amount of representation doesn't feel special. Right. And until, it, and, until it does, until we can get there, it has to feel special. Uh, it has to feel no. special. And, and I think you can also, um, you can have a radical voice and still be kind. Well, I you feel know? more of that. And I, I hope that people who listen to this um, know that there are people out there in America <laughs> and probably in other parts of the world who are also having these conversations. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so honored to have touched in with you guys and, and to, hear you, your, um, to hear your wisdom, your lens on it and, and what you're doing. Um, I'm, I'm gonna put a link below um, for anybody who wants to donate to any one of these theaters. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm, I don't know you guys, um, good luck. Right? I mean, yeah. Mike, thanks for having us. Mike, it's really nice to meet you, Matt. I'll see you nice in what? Well. Three weeks, month? I don't know. I've got schedules, okay. but I'll see you soon. Thank you for taking the time out. Mike, really good to see you. Again. I know, Jerry, you and I got to catch up. We got to do We really that. do. I got to do this. But seriously, all you guys, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. That was my first episode of Tosh Talk. Um, you are going to be able to see this on YouTube, on my Facebook fan page, on my Instagram. They will, everything will be linked below in the description. Um, and I would also like to introduce uh, the man behind the Zoom, which is Alice Gage, <laughs> my incredibly talented uh, actor, friend, also IT genius, um, uh, for to, for curating and, and uh, doing this um, doing this chat. Um, stay tuned. There will be a lot more um, where this came from. Um, I had this impulse to uh, talk and um, to engage in these conversations starting from, you know, every talk back I've ever done after a show um, to these really interesting conversations uh, that I had during this pandemic. And um, I, 
there'll be more to come. Um, I hope you will follow. Again, all my information will be below to, um, to follow. If you uh, please comment, please have conversations about this stuff. Um, I very much wanted to make a space for a purely artistic conversation. Um, and again, these are my friends and I value and look up to them as artistic collaborators. And I knew, I hope that you enjoyed hearing um, from, from these incredible artistic leaders um, who I am grateful <laughs> and unworthy to call friends um, and employers. <laughs> but anyway, um, thanks so much for watching. There will be more Tosh Talk. Rust. Um, and I will see you in the next one. Um, again, all information below. See you next time on Tosh Talk.